bargain shopping. It was as popular at the turn of the century as it is today, and it all started with F.W. Woolworth. Five and Dimes appealed to so many people because they were cheap. Nickels and Dimes made Woolworth a multi-millionaire. He lived like a king and gorged himself on fancy foods and rich desserts. Even the building he erected was as grand as a castle. There was a competition to be the tallest building, and that was a competition that Woolworth won. His granddaughter, Barbara Hutton, inherited his fortune, along with his spending habits. She was beautiful, and she had a lot of money. Hutton went through $50 million and seven husbands, including a Russian prince, a Danish count, even actor Cary Grant. But it wasn't enough. She truly was America's poor little rich girl. Money doesn't come with instructions. Woolworths. It made the family millions, but brought them nothing but unhappiness. Frank Winfield Woolworth, a man who amassed a fortune from nickels and dimes, began his life in quite humble surroundings. The Woolworth family had been farming for generations, and it was on a small plot of land in the tiny community of Great Bend, New York, that Frank Woolworth was born on April 13, 1852. Frank's father, John Woolworth, had been raised a strict Methodist and passed on to Frank and his younger brother, Charles, the virtues of hard work and discipline. Life on the farm was tough, and the Woolworths struggled constantly to make ends meet. Frank and his brother each owned just one pair of boots, which they wore during the cold winters and to church on Sundays. Frank's father was strict and firm with his boys, but his mother, Fanny Woolworth, had a kind heart, and she worried the strain of life on the farm would be too much for her eldest son. He was a mother's boy, no question about that. He was frail, scrawny, shy, reserved. Not the kind of son that his father would expect, because his father was a, a dirt farmer. The two boys rose at five each morning to clean the barn and milk the cows. After his chores were done, Frank would often sneak away from home to an abandoned mansion that Joseph Bonaparte, elder brother of Napoleon, had built. Frank was captivated by the tales he heard about the Bonapartes, and it was here his lifelong obsession with Napoleon began. He recognized that Napoleon had enormous drive and determination and had conquered the world, and Frank must have seen him as a kind of role model. Frank's parents were too poor to send him to college, and he left the local school at age 16. His father wanted him to continue the family tradition of farming, but Frank despised the drudgery of farm work. He wanted a job that would keep him inside, where he'd be warm and dry. In 1871, at the age of 19, Frank Woolworth left home in search of his fortune. He headed to nearby Watertown, a small city located just an hour north of Syracuse. Here, he landed his first job at a dry goods store and was so eager for the opportunity that he agreed to work for nothing in exchange for the experience. On his first day of work, it became clear to his boss, William Henry Moore, just how green Frank was. He just didn't really know the first thing about sales or about retailing, about how to work with customers, about how to uh, make change from a cash drawer. And uh, Moore happened to be particularly difficult and not necessarily uh, very warm about showing him how to do these things. And it um, caused Woolworth a lot of embarrassment. But he stuck it out, and after 18 months, Frank was earning $6 a week. He worked 14 hours a day, stocking shelves, waiting on customers, and creating fancy displays, which he proved to have quite a flair for. But he wanted more. So in 1875, at the age of 23, he took a job at Bushnell's, Moore's biggest competitor, this time as a salesman. But he was miserable at it. 
and couldn't convince customers to buy more than they had come in for. After a few short months, Bushnell cut his wages by 20%. Frank was humiliated and suffered a breakdown, unable to work. He returned to his parents' home and for the next 18 months lay in bed, weeping uncontrollably for hours at a time. It was something he would do for the rest of his life whenever he was feeling overwhelmed. During this dark period, a bright spot emerged. Jenny Creighton, a 23-year-old with blonde hair and big blue eyes, moved into the Woolworths' home to help nurse Frank back to health. She was pretty, strictly virginal, and simple, an open character without any sophistication, who had no idea what was coming her way. As Jenny tended to Frank, the two fell in love. They were married on June 11, 1876, in the parlor of the Woolworths home. With a new bride to support, Frank forced himself to get out of bed. He accepted a job from his old boss at Moore and Smith's and the newlyweds moved back into Watertown. The year was 1875. The country was mired in a deep recession, and the retail industry hit hard. To move merchandise, Frank's boss decided to try a recent trend in retail, a five-cent line. The idea was new to store owners in upstate New York. By 1878, most goods were not sold at fixed prices. Instead, it was up to the customer to bargain with a sales clerk for the best price. Merchandise was always kept behind the counter, stacked in neat rows, and the sales clerk was the only one allowed to touch it. The goods were not out on display. The goods were not designed to sell themselves. The shopping experience there was probably one where someone went into a store looking for something very specific to buy, not to browse, not to enjoy shopping. Moore decided to change all that and put Frank in charge of his new five-cent line. On a separate counter, away from all the other goods, Frank laid out pens, tin pans, and cloth napkins, all to be sold for only a nickel. The customers loved it, and week after week, Frank watched their excitement grow. He decided the fad was popular enough to support an entire store, even though at the time a five-cent store was practically unheard of. The gamble was a big one for Frank, since he now had a young daughter, Helena, to support. After borrowing $300 from his old boss, Frank left his young family behind in search of a location for his first store. He would find it here in the small city of Utica, New York. The city's main streets bustled with activity, and the sidewalks were crowded with shoppers. But property there was too expensive and Frank had to settle on a small storefront off on a quiet side street. He spread his meager lot of soaps and candlesticks on top of makeshift counters, and he hung a collection of pots and pans outside. Brimming with confidence, he named his new venture the Great Five Cent Store. Frank opened on a Saturday, and by the end of his first week, the cash box held $240, a decent amount of money in those days. F.W. thought he was onto something, but the store was too far away from the hustle and bustle of the downtown business district. And as the novelty slowly wore off, customers stopped coming in. After just three months in business, F.W. decided to close up shop. His first attempt at the five cent trade, a failure. But he had learned a very important lesson, one he would never forget. Location was everything. F.W. Woolworth was 27 years old when his first business venture failed. But with a family to support, he couldn't afford to fall apart. In June of 1879, he packed his bags and headed off alone again, this time settling on Lancaster, Pennsylvania, a small Quaker city in the southeastern part of the state. Frank had learned an important lesson from his first failure. Location was the key to success. Once in Lancaster, he was only interested in a shop on one of the city's busiest streets. Never again would customers have to venture off of the main street to find a Woolworth store. He always located at the most central locations on the main streets. 
where the, if there was a public transit system, where those streetcars were dropping people off. He was looking for the pedestrian traffic. Woolworth's instinct proved to be right. As soon as the doors opened, customers crowded the store, and by the end of the day, his pile of nickels totaled $127, the most he had ever made in a single day. The steady stream of customers in and out of his new store encouraged Frank to think big. And two months later, he opened his second store on one of the busiest streets in Harrisburg, recruiting his younger brother, Charles Sumner Woolworth, to run it. At 27, F.W. had been in business long enough to know that there were only so many goods he could sell for a nickel and still make a profit. When he opened his third store in Scranton, Pennsylvania on November 6, 1879, F.W. introduced a second line, this time for 10 cents. Outside the shop, he hung a new sign, the Woolworth Brothers 5 and 10 cents store. It was the first of its kind anywhere in the world. With three stores now open, Frank was forced to implement a set of rules that would apply to all of them. Principles he would never forget. Pay for everything in cash. Offer your customers bargains. And most important, keep the items out where everyone could see them. This way, the goods would sell themselves. At the time, this was a revolutionary concept in retail. These are goods which aren't going to look good by themselves, pots and pans or kitchen utensils. Being able to display them in a very attractive way suggests that these are goods, even if they're cheap, which have some quality to them. They're not shoddy. They're better than their 5 and 10 price. By allowing his customers to handle the merchandise, Woolworth was the first retailer to make shopping a favorite pastime. He was also the first merchant to cater to the working class. But because his goods sold for only nickels and dimes, F.W. didn't expect that owning a few stores would ever make him rich. So he began to build what would become one of the country's first chain stores, recruiting family and trusted friends from his early days in Watertown. He chose his future managers very early on, uh, when they were very young. Many of them came from Watertown. Many of them were his immediate family and his family's friends. Frank's business was growing as fast as his family at home. On July 12, 1883, his second daughter, Edna, was born. But Edna and her older sister, Helena, saw little of their father growing up. Frank traveled constantly, scouting for store locations and new merchandise. Any money he made went right back into the business. By 1885, he had opened several more stores throughout New York and Pennsylvania. Some he owned outright, and others he co-owned with family and friends. Frank liked to say they were all like one big family, but it was clear to everyone involved that he was in charge. Frank alone bought all the merchandise, and he instructed each partner to keep the jewelry cases polished and to put the prettiest girls behind the counter. And he demanded daily trading reports from each one, even though they were his trusted friends and relatives. Well, he was dictatorial. He f was firing off letters and memos to all of his managers, telling them exactly what to do. And the reports that he expected to receive from them included how much money had been spent on postage. I mean, we're talking nickels and dimes <laughs> in every sense of the word. Frank bought the bulk of his five and dime trinkets from suppliers in New York City, so in 1886, Woolworth moved his family to Brooklyn. Frank celebrated his success by buying his first home, a relatively modest townhouse in Bedford-Stuyvesant. Jenny hoped he would finally slow down and spend more time at home. But his constant traveling and long hours left little time for her or their girls. Helena now eight, Edna, now three, and Jesse, born just a few months before the move, essentially grew up without a father. Certainly he saw them, but my intuitive feeling is that they were not central to, to his life in, in business. And, and so he um, didn't invest uh, that relationship with the importance that he might have invested a relationship with a son if he had one. 
In 1894, at the age of 42, F.W. boarded the steamship City of Paris for his first trip to Europe, a business trip that would change his life. He fell in love with the grandeur of Europe, and in weekly letters to his managers, Frank told them of the finely dressed Englishmen in top hats and tails, the luxurious hotels in Paris, and the sumptuous food in Vienna. It implanted in his mind illusions or delusions of grandeur. He realized that he needed to look the part, wear tall silk hats. He began to acquire his jewelry collection, gold cufflinks, diamond stick pin, because he was obviously a social climber. By 1895, sales of Woolworth and Company passed the million dollar mark for the first time. And the poor farm boy from upstate New York now began to cast himself as a member of America's emerging royalty, the new class of merchant princes. F.W. wanted his new establishments to reflect his growing stature, and in 1896, he opened a store in New York City on 6th Avenue and 17th Street, an area known as the Ladies' Mile. Woolworth knew he couldn't compete with the grand emporiums that surrounded him. B. Altman's and Wanamaker's had fancy tea rooms and marble staircases and catered to a high-class clientele. But Woolworth's new shop was a far cry from the country stores he once operated. The wooden floors were polished to a deep shine, goods were displayed in cabinets made from fine mahogany, and the lamps overhead were now electrical, not kerosene. It was clear that style had become increasingly important to Frank, and he felt his Brooklyn townhouse was now too small and insignificant to suit a man of his circumstance. In the spring of 1901, Woolworth moved his family into this mansion on 5th Avenue and 80th Street. Its 30 rooms were decorated with oriental rugs and tapestried furnishings, and its walls covered with gold paneling. Frank's new address put him exactly where he wanted to be, on New York's most fashionable street, surrounded by the country's wealthiest families, the Whitneys, the Carnegies, and the Vanderbilts. But his neighbors never once invited him to one of their grand balls. To them, Frank was nothing more than a shopkeeper, and they snubbed him. He would spend the rest of his life trying to get their attention. At the turn of the century, the United States was a vastly different country than it had been just 50 years before. Thousands of European immigrants had come through New York Harbor in search of a better life, and by 1900, the country's population had nearly doubled. The nation's economy had been virtually transformed by the Industrial Revolution, and factories were now churning out better and better products at a dizzying pace. As the economy boomed, so too did Woolworth's empire. By 1900, Woolworth's stores had sold more than $5 million in goods. Because Frank moved merchandise at such a high volume, he was able to dictate terms to suppliers and actually change the way some goods were manufactured. For example, before Woolworth's, only the wealthy could afford to buy candy at stores set up to buy by the piece. By buying in bulk, Woolworth convinced confectioners to mass produce candy, and soon anyone with a nickel or a dime could enjoy a treat. He works with these people in order to design the right kinds of goods at the right kinds of prices, almost beyond the odds, what one would have expected, be able to maintain a five and 10 operation, which still sells for five cents and 10 cents. By 1901, Frank Woolworth had 120 stores spread out all across the United States. At age 49, he had become a household name among working-class Americans, but to the doyens of high society, he was still nothing more than a shopkeeper. His whole operation was really down market, as we say, and the other people in New York society felt that way about him. He was down market, too. F.W. could afford to buy a certain amount of respectability, he didn't attempt to join J.P. Morgan's exclusive Metropolitan Club, 
but he was a member of several second-tier clubs like the Hardware Club and the Union League Club. Frank was also a permanent fixture at the Waldorf Hotel's men-only lunches, and it was here he indulged in the rich foods he had missed as a young boy on the farm. Lobster and cream sauce and giant porterhouse steaks were his daily fare, and soon Frank was tipping the scales at 250 pounds. But this was an age when fat was fashionable, a sign of success, and Frank began to model himself after President William Howard Taft, who himself weighed close to 300 pounds. He was a great admirer of President Taft. He grew a mustache just like Taft's. He took to wearing silk hats just like Taft's. And when, and when Taft took up golf, Frank bought himself a set of clubs. There's no report that he ever played a game of golf, but at least he had the clubs. Frank's business empire was growing even faster than his waistline, and in 1911, the formation of the F.W. Woolworth Corporation was announced to the public. The $65 million deal brought together 560 stores in the United States and Europe under one roof. The merger solidified F.W. standing as king of the five and 10 cent trade, but it wasn't enough. At 59, Frank wanted something that would carry his name long after he was gone, a monument that would rival anything his neighbors, the Rockefellers or the Carnegies, had ever built. He knew the world's tallest skyscraper would get their attention, so on November 15, 1911, construction crews broke ground on a building designed to impress the world. Of course, it would carry the Woolworth name. There was this desire to celebrate his own personal success, his business's success, meaning the success of the five and 10, but that was just an extension of his own ego. So it was really his own personal success that he was celebrating. For the next two years, F.W. was consumed with the construction of his building, agonizing over every detail. The pressure to impress was so great, he began to crack weeping uncontrollably for hours at a time, just as he had done as a young man after failing for the first time. But he held on, and by 1913, the Woolworth Building loomed high above the New York skyline. Frank had finally gotten his wish. At 790 feet, the Woolworth Building was now the tallest building in the world. People were delighted and amazed by it, amazed by its size, that something like this could be built, that Americans could build a building of this scale, uh, of this height, and of this beauty. Inside the new building, F.W. decorated his office in the Empire style, a style favored by his boyhood hero, Napoleon Bonaparte, whose portrait hung proudly on the wall across from his desk. The press dubbed it the Cathedral of Commerce, a description that pleased Frank enormously. At age 61, he had finally made his mark. Woolworth suddenly became one of the recognizable names of the United States, along with Henry Ford and John D. Rockefeller and Commodore Vanderbilt and F.W. Woolworth. But he didn't stop there. In 1914, F.W. built himself another mansion, this time on 18 acres in Glen Cove, Long Island. Frank called it his summer retreat and filled its 60 rooms with priceless antiques. But he would have very little time left to enjoy it. Jenny Woolworth was now 61, but looked years older. Her blue eyes had lost their brilliance, and she spent most of her days sitting in a rocking chair, staring into space. Her emotional state was not helped by the tragic circumstances surrounding the death of her second daughter, Edna. At the age of 32, Edna had found her marriage to financier Franklin Hutton to be as loveless as her childhood, and in 1917, she committed suicide. Edna left behind a young daughter, four-year-old Barbara Hutton. Following her mother's death, the little girl was shuttled from house to house and relative to relative. By this time, Frank was also very ill. He had always ignored the advice of his doctors and was now grossly overweight, his teeth rotten from his years of overindulgence. 
On April 4th, 1919, Frank Woolworth spent his last day at the office. Feeling poorly, he retreated to his home on Long Island. Four days later, he was dead. Doctors listed the cause of death as pneumonia complicated by poisoning from the teeth. He was 67 years old. Jenny Woolworth never knew it. After five more years of senility, Jenny died at the age of 71. The two were buried in an elaborate granite tomb Frank had erected at Woodlawn Cemetery in the Bronx. Unlike many of the other wealthy entrepreneurs of that era, Frank Woolworth left none of his money to charity. Instead, it was all given to his family, a fortune that would eventually lead to tragedy, scandal, and wasted lives. When F.W. died in 1919, control of the Woolworth Empire, the business he had built, went to his brother, Charles Sumner, and to his three other partners. After Jenny Woolworth's death in 1924, F.W.'s entire estate, now worth $78 million, was divided evenly between his two surviving daughters, Helena McCann and Jesse Donahue, and his granddaughter, Barbara Hutton, who was now just 11 years old. Barbara's mother, Edna Woolworth Hutton, had committed suicide in 1917, leaving Barbara one of the principal heirs to the Woolworth fortune. Her aunts lived the gilded life of many daughters of rich industrialists. They kept posh townhomes in New York and country places among the swells of Oyster Bay and Palm Beach. But it was young Barbara who captured the nation's attention. Her father, Franklin Hutton, had been too busy making a name for himself on Wall Street to take care of his little girl. And Barbara was shuttled between relatives, growing up without a home to call her own. The press dubbed her the poor little rich girl. Barbara spent her teenage years raised by headmistresses at the exclusive boarding schools of Miss Hewitt's in Manhattan and Miss Porter's in Farmington, Connecticut. The pudgy young girl with the enormous blue eyes and thick dark eyebrows was ostracized by most of her classmates who thought, as their grandparents did, that her dime store fortune was common and crass. Barbara's father had always resented his daughter and the fortune she had inherited, and he and his new wife now made little effort to include her in their lives. They left her there over Christmas vacation. I, I just couldn't imagine that. I mean, the whole school shuts down Christmas time. How could you do that to a child? You know, and, and I guess that's when my, my sister found out about that and made sure that if her parents weren't going to take her home for Thanksgiving or Christmas, that she came to us. Barbara's time with her uncle, stockbroker E.F. Hutton, and his wife, the former Marjorie Merriweather Post, was the only real family life she knew. But her visits to Mar-a-Lago, their vast Palm Beach estate, were far more than the standard family get-together. Mrs. Hutton gave these fantastic parties for the Ziegfeld Follies, and it was really incredibly glamorous. That was Barbara's first taste of high life. And I think she made up her mind that when she was 17 that she wanted that kind of a life forever. A year later, on December 23, 1930, as the country suffered through the Great Depression and bread lines stretched down city blocks, Barbara Hutton, the Woolworth heiress, was presented to New York society wearing white satin and pearls. The Depression was forgotten by those inside the ball who feasted on champagne and caviar and danced merrily to the music of three full orchestras. But outside the party, the gaunt faces of onlookers reflected the misery of a nation. For them, Barbara's show of wealth was in very poor taste. The crowds outside were hungry, angry, and forlorn. And they were vocal in their fury. I remember one of them saying, it's that poor little rich girl celebrating in there. Another said, you mean that poor little bitch girl, don't you? That was about the temper at the times. The image of a young girl spending her fortune of nickels and dimes also infuriated the men who now ran her grandfather's company, 
and they pressured the heiress to sell the remainder of her Woolworth stock. Barbara's father took the proceeds from that sale and invested it wisely. So wisely that when she turned 21 in 1933 and came into her inheritance, her fortune had doubled from 25 million to 50 million. Now she was free to spend as she liked. That same year, Barbara met Alexis Midivani, a champion polo player and a descendant of Russian royalty. Barbara was dazzled by his dark, good looks and enchanted by his title. She knew she was ostracized for many reasons. The fact that she had so much money that people didn't like her for herself. The fact that she was chubby when she was supposed to be thin. The fact that she wasn't smart in school, all of these things. She felt the title would bring her enormous prestige and brilliance. 4,000 people crowded the streets outside the Russian cathedral in Paris to witness the marriage of the American heiress and her Russian prince. Barbara wore a cream satin gown, a diamond tiara, and a strand of pearls worth a million dollars. She and the prince exchanged vows as attendants held crowns over their heads. But trouble began almost immediately. Midavani ridiculed his emotionally fragile bride, calling her fat and ordering her to lose weight. Barbara was devastated, and for the rest of her life, she was obsessed with her weight. For years, she subsisted on little more than cigarettes and black coffee. She wouldn't eat because she was afraid she'd gain weight all her life, all her life. And she wasn't very tall anyway. She was only about 5'4 or something like that. So she just was terrified of, of putting on weight. Hutton's marriage to Mitovani lasted just two years. On May 13, 1935, they were divorced in Reno, Nevada, and Mitovani walked away with $2 million. The following day, the dime store heiress swapped one title for another, marrying 40-year-old Kurt Haugwitz Reventlo, a Danish count. She was convinced the much older Reventlo would provide her with the family life she so desperately wanted. The following year, at the age of 24, Barbara gave birth to her first and only child, a boy she christened Lance. She was told she never could have any children, so it was a complete and wonderful surprise when she had Lance. Barbara and her family moved into a $3 million mansion she built with Woolworth money on 14 acres of London's Regent's Park. It was the only real home she had ever had, and Barbara spent months shopping for crystal chandeliers and priceless antiques to fill its 40 rooms. At 26, Barbara had evolved from a plump and dowdy teenager into a slender and sophisticated young woman. But her marriage to Reventlo was an empty one. Kurt preferred the company of his older friends and spent hours at his exclusive all-male clubs. It was 1939, and the threat of another world war loomed over Europe. Hitler's invasion of Czechoslovakia and Poland dominated the British headlines, and the country moved closer and closer to war. Barbara knew that if she was going to leave Reventlo and return to the United States, she had to do it now. The mansion was boarded up and her valuable antiques put into storage. Leaving her husband behind, Barbara and her son, now three, boarded a ship and set sail for the United States. Barbara's return to the U.S. was greeted with much animosity. Thousands of Woolworth clerks were now out on strike and they occupied several stores, demanding higher wages and the right to form a union. The sight of the young Woolworth heiress dripping in jewels as she pulled up in front of New York's Pierre Hotel enraged them, and they surrounded the car, shouting insults and holding signs that read, Barbara Hutton, is $18 a week too much? They were not being paid sufficiently, and obviously the culprit had to be the heiress to that great assemblage of stores, namely Barbara. Uh, unjustly so, because Barbara had nothing whatsoever to do with the operation of, or even the proprietorship, of the F.W. Woolworth Empire at that time. 
Once again, Barbara had become a public relations liability for the company and to the Woolworth name. In an attempt to distract attention from her profligate ways, she donated $15 million to the British and American Red Cross and even did some knitting for the French war relief. But Barbara was not happy living in New York. She resented reporters' criticism of her every move, and in 1941, with her divorce from the Count now final, Barbara and her five-year-old son moved to Los Angeles. Done with European titles, the Woolworth heiress turned her attention to Hollywood royalty, beginning a romance with actor Cary Grant, who had just finished filming The Philadelphia Story. The two were married on July 8th, 1942, in a small civil ceremony. The press dubbed the new couple Cash and Cary. He was the most caring and loving of the husbands that she ever had. He cared about her well-being. And the others really didn't. And he didn't marry her for her material wealth, shall we say. I think he genuinely, genuinely cared about her. But like her first two marriages, this one would not last. Grant disliked the social circuit and preferred to spend his evenings at home. Barbara grew bored with their quiet lifestyle, and in 1945, the two divorced. The poor little rich girl found herself alone again, her search for love and happiness not yet over. At the end of World War II, Europe lay in ruins. As cities across the continent began the painful task of rebuilding, Barbara Hutton returned to Europe to resume her round of parties and entertaining. The heir to the Woolworth fortune spent months at a time at the famous Lido Beach in Venice and at her favorite suite at the Ritz-Carlton in Paris. But Barbara couldn't stand to be alone, and in 1953, at the age of 41, she married for a fifth time to Dominican playboy Porfirio Ruberosa. Like her first husband, Ruberosa was also a champion polo player, but he was better known for his sexual prowess and his socially advantageous marriages, having recently divorced tobacco heiress Doris Duke. Doris told Barbara that, darling, you'll feel wonderful if you married uh, Ruby because he has something that'll just, you go to heaven, you know. So Barbara got all excited. Well, it was a disaster because he didn't even like Barbara. On her wedding day, Barbara looked sad and withdrawn. She surprised everyone by dressing all in black, as if she were attending a funeral instead of a wedding. The poor little rich girl said her I do's under the ever watchful eye of the press. And after she and Ruba Rosa were pronounced man and wife, Barbara whispered to her husband, kiss me, Ruby, that's what they're waiting for. But the marriage was doomed from the start. The dashing playboy was carrying on with actress Zsa Zsa Gabor, an affair he'd been having for months. After 73 days, the marriage was dissolved. Ruberosa walked away with $2 million of the Woolworth fortune, and Barbara found herself alone again. Everybody who was with her had an agenda. Barbara, give this party. Barbara, do that. You've got to do this. You've got to meet so-and-so. Everybody pushing their own agenda on her. No, being rich was not all that much fun. Barbara eventually married two more times, but they too would end in divorce. Her search for love and happiness had brought her nothing but heartache. And in 1966, at the age of 54, she found herself alone for good. Barbara had hoped her relationship with her son might help fill the void, but over the years, she and Lance had never spent much time together. She had neglected him, just as her father had neglected her. He was off in boarding schools a lot, and uh, Barbara had a schedule, a certain amount of time in Paris, a certain amount of time in Morocco, a certain amount of time in Mexico. You know, she would go from social season to social season, house to house. Lance lived much differently than his mother had, spending most of his time in Los Angeles. The youngest heir to the Woolworth fortune did have one extravagance, his passion for race cars. By 18, he was racing professionally and earned a name for himself on the international circuit, winning several Grand Prix events. 
He also designed and built his own race car, paid for with Woolworth money. But the family's legacy of tragedy followed him too. In 1972, Lance Raventlow was killed in a plane crash in the mountains above Aspen, Colorado. He was only 35. Barbara would never have the chance to repair their relationship, and she was devastated. Barbara said she never would raise her child the way she was raised, and then, of course, she did. She did exactly the same thing. Following her son's death, Barbara retreated into lavish isolation. Inside a suite at the Beverly Wilshire Hotel, she spent her days lying in bed with the shades drawn, days that would turn into years. Barbara spent her life searching for happiness, and happiness is what eluded her. And so the old platitude is best illustrated by Barbara's life. Money does not buy happiness. And no one learned that more tragically than Barbara did. By the late 70s, Barbara had run through $50 million of her Woolworth inheritance. Most of it frittered away on jewels, lavish homes, and husbands who had never loved her. After suffering a heart attack, she died alone on May 11, 1979, at the age of 66. Like her grandfather, she had spent her fortune only on herself. I was sad that she didn't do more with her life and didn't use some of the money that she had to help other people. When anybody is blessed with something like that, you have to put something back into the world. And I think she would have gained so much as a person by doing that and would have had so much more enjoyment from life. While Barbara Hutton spent most of her life squandering her enormous fortune, her grandfather, F.W. Woolworth, spent most of his life making it. When he died, he left his family millions, but not one of them inherited his intense work ethic. He worked himself to death, and they idled themselves to death. That's a basic difference. None of them ever worked. F.W. Woolworth dedicated his life to retail, and in doing so, revolutionized the industry. He created one of the country's first chain stores and stocked his shelves with all kinds of trinkets that sold for only a nickel or a dime. He encouraged working-class customers to browse, making shopping fun, and making his stores an indispensable part of American life. Woolworth brought the products of a newly industrialized society to Mr. and Mrs. America. He thought of something that improved the life of the average American. F.W. erected the Woolworth building as a monument to himself, a testament to the empire he built from just nickels and dimes. But Woolworth's true legacy lies in the fortune he left behind a fortune that never ensured his happiness or the happiness of his family. <laughs>